It's a dark part of our past. Slavery was long gone, but equality not exactly on the horizon. Jim Crow laws, separate but equal, only legalized racism. It was a racial caste system with a stiff and cruel punishment. Death for people who bucked the system and ignored whites only signs like these. The lynchings were often public for everyone to see. The bodies strung up in trees for days as a warning to all. For the most part, as long as the rules were followed, black families were finally able to travel and vacation in all the places they'd only heard of, but at their own risk. They got to the hotel where they had made their reservations and they were told they weren't welcome. And here they were with their luggage, having taken an airplane. Families with kids in suitcases with nowhere to sleep for the night because there was no black hotel or safe house for miles. People were turned away over and over and over again. People spent the night in their cars. A lot of times they would just bring their own uh, food so they wouldn't have to deal with the uncomfortableness of being unwelcome in a place. They needed to have some kind of a guide to tell them where they would be welcomed. They needed a fearless man, a man with connections in high and low places, a man who knew his city inside and out. A postal worker named Victor Green decided to start taking notes of where African Americans would be comfortable and welcomed in New York City. The Negro Motorist Green Book, as it was called, went to print in the 1940s, at a time when so few blacks were published authors. It listed all the known lodgings that accepted black business, everything from tailors to nightclubs, squeezed onto a tiny page. In small print on the cover, a sometimes life-saving reminder, carry your Green Book with you, you may need it. It's listed as a travel guide for African Americans, but this green book was so much more. This was the survival guide that saved black families from public embarrassment. Better than a AAA guide would be now. It's like it, it really provides a, a roadmap for people so that they don't have to worry, be concerned, be nervous about what's going to happen once they get somewhere. Then it became so popular that he decided to go into all the states. So by the late 1940s, by the time of the Green Book that we have in our collection, 1949, it lists a state by state by state. This is Hastings Street on Detroit's east side. When you walk down a street like this, you might not realize its cultural significance, but it's definitely here. There were eight listings in the Green Book right here on this street. They were hotels, restaurants, and even nightclubs. Well, now there's only a stamping plant here. All of those other buildings have been knocked down. But the history of Hastings, it's still here. I'm too close. These are some of the only known pictures of Detroit's Hastings Street in its heyday. The popular restaurant, the Blue Goose, and Barthwell's, a pharmacy on the corner of Hastings and Benton, are listed under Detroit in the Green Book. Only 16 Michigan cities appear in the 1949 edition, not even two full pages of black-friendly business for the entire state. Updated versions of the Green Book went to press for more than a decade. Printing ended in 1964 when the Civil Rights Act was passed. At its height, the Green Book included destinations in Bermuda and Mexico. But it had such a low print run, it's hard to get your hands on a copy. In fact, we couldn't even touch it. But you can read the 1949 edition line by line at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn. The display is part of the museum's Driving America exhibit. It uses iPhone technology to put you up close and personal with this little piece of black history. You can view a digital scan of every page, including the Michigan page. And who knows, maybe you'll discover a piece of history in the present. There still might be a sign, there might be a foundation, there might be something there It's definitely worth trying to find the remains of history. Ah.